We are going to get started. Hi, everyone, and welcome. I'm Bunny Ellerin, uh, the uh, president and co-founder of New York City Health Business Leaders, um, but I'm also the director of healthcare, uh, the healthcare and pharmaceutical management program at Columbia Business School. And it's always nice when I can bring those two worlds together. Um, and that, that's what we're doing today. Um, I wanted to give you a few program notes first. Um, just for folks, uh, we have a couple of upcoming events. One is um, on September 29th, The Patient Equation with Glenn DeVries, uh, the co-founder and co-CEO of Medidata. He is incredibly funny uh, as well as successful, so that will be a lot of fun. And then on October 15th, we're going to be talking about telehealth. Um, and the exuberance has been great, but uh, we're going to talk about what the reality is going forward. And so it'll be a it'll be a real dialogue. And then also just put it on your radar. Um, in December, we are going to do a benefit called Healthcare Rocks. It's a virtual benefit concert. We're looking for nominations um, for frontline workers. Uh, we'll be sending out. Um, uh oh, why no video? Somebody said why no video for participants. Um, I don't. Are people not seeing video? Okay, other people see it. Okay, great. Okay, great. Um, <laughs> the pleasure of Zoom. All right, so we're going to be sending out nominations for frontline workers who we want to honor. And um, we are going to have live, we're going to have live bands, uh, we're going to donate money to charity, it's going to be very fun. And, and it's going to be um, a really nice way to acknowledge folks who have done so much during COVID. Um, we also have some sponsorship opportunities. So if anybody on the call is interested, please get in touch with us after that. And then finally, uh, just the rules of the road. For audience Q&A, um, submit it in the Q&A box, not the chat box, because we're really not going to be monitoring that. Um, and we will select a few live questions um, at, you know, towards the end-ish, and then I will unmute you um, if you're selected. So I'm going to stop that share now, and I am going to introduce our guest. So Dr. Ushay Blackstock um, is an emergency medicine physician, and she's also one of the nation's leading voices um, on health disparities and equity. She spent 15 years in academic medicine, most recently at NYU Langone, um, at, before leaving at the end of 2019 to launch her company, Advancing Health Equity. We're gonna spend a lot of time talking about that, so I'm not gonna describe it yet. Um, but I do want to say that Dr. Blackstock appears frequently in the media. Um, whenever I turn it on, I see her on CNN, uh, MSNBC, Yahoo News. And also she testified before Congress um, about the, the, health, the racial health disparities during COVID-19. Um, and just this week, to show you how lucky we are to have her, uh, she was she was on a, a call or on a video, a Medscape video with the one and only Eric Tobel um, and Abraham Verghese. Uh, many of you must know he cutting for cutting for stone, and so we're so so lucky to have you, uh, Dr. Blackstock. One last thing: she is a graduate of Harvard College and Harvard Medical School. And I actually wanted to start there um, because you've got a very interesting story around Harvard Medical School, your twin sister and your mom. So would love for you to, to tell the audience a little bit about that and how that also influenced where you are today. Well, thank you so much for that really lovely introduction, Bunny. And I'm so excited to be with, here with you in the audience and to hear um, questions later on. And so just a little bit about me in that context. Um, I'm talking to you all from Brooklyn, New York, like where, where Bunny is. And I, I actually grew up about 15 mi minutes from where I am right now in Crown Heights. Um, Brooklyn, but also my mother, who was the original Dr. Dale Blackstock, the original Dr. Blackstock, um, also grew up um, near here. 
Um, and I, I think what is so unusual is that, you know, only 2% of physicians are Black women. And so to, to be a second generation physician, to have my mom, you know, also have been a physician is actually quite, quite rare. Uh, we actually are the first um, Black mother-daughter legacy from Harvard Medical School, which I say um, as a a tribute to my mom. Um, I'll share that you know she passed away when we were in college from acute myelogenous leukemia. But what my mother did was even after um, you know going to Harvard Medical School, she grew up in you know before that she grew up in poverty. She was the first person in her family uh, to go to college. She went to Brooklyn College and had a chemistry professor there who really saw her potential and her drive and her work ethic and recommended, uh, suggested that she apply to medical school. So she applied to like 10 medical schools, she got into all of them because she was brilliant. And she ended up matriculating at Harvard Medical School. But after that, she came back to Brooklyn, to the neighborhood where she grew up in. And she worked here for many, many years before her death. And she, you know, she took care of patients who were her neighbors. She mentored uh, junior faculty as well as, as medical students of color. And so what I learned from her is this 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 real this obligation that I'm not here on this journey called life by myself that I actually have an obligation to to my community to people who have supported me and that was sort of one of the inspirations that um, you know involved in starting my organization advancing health equity. You know I'm really happy to hear that um, somebody encouraged your mom because oftentimes it's the exact opposite that happens right that people discourage people from well. Well, she did have an, uh, she, she did tell a nun in junior high school that she went to a Catholic high school um, and she told a nun that she was thinking about becoming a physician and the nun told her in seventh grade, um, most likely you'll just be able to become a social worker and not a physician. And, and mind you, I have tremendous respect for social workers, but again, sort of limiting um, the opportunities of, uh, you know, that she could, you know, really accomplish. And the possibilities, yeah. And the, poss and the possibilities, yeah. So, Ushe, um, you wrote a really important piece in January um, in STAT about why, why Black doctors like me are leaving academic medicine or faculty positions in academic medicine. And I think that sets up the whole story incredibly well. I've read it several times. It's very, very impactful. Um, so can you talk about why you wrote it? What was it like or what's it like to be a Black woman in medicine and why you ultimately left? Yeah, I, I will say when I wrote that piece, and it's interesting because I think there are a portion of people who read that piece and they realize that when I when I wrote it, I was so sad. I, I wrote it like in, in tears because I never thought I would leave academic medicine. Like that's where I, I, I love the environment. It's incredibly mm -hmm. stimulating. I, I love teaching medical students and residents. I enjoy learning from my colleagues. There's a lot of, you know, research, um, clinical work um, going on that, you know, that I felt like would develop me. And I was promoted last year to associate professor. So, you know, it was, you know, when I told people that I was leaving, they were shocked. But, you know, really what happened was I started doing diversity, equity, and inclusion work. I was, I was handpicked um, to be um, a leadership, a faculty director in our Office of Diversity Affairs. And, you know, maybe I was naive, but I thought that I would be able to to have the freedom to, to, to do what I thought was, was right and what was needed. And I think what happens in a lot of institutions and a lot of organizations that have a traditional, um, sometimes conservative culture, that, that, that is medicine. Um, I think that, you know, for me as a black woman, I could not speak up. I could not be honest about, you know, what were the issues. And I was actually almost like silenced and muzzled. Um, yeah. yeah, so like all of our programming, all of our newsletters had to go through our leadership. It doesn't look like me. And they felt that it was, um, you know, too inflammatory when obviously when it actually wasn't inflammatory. It was, it was the conversations that we need to be having. <clears throat> and so, you know, once I realized that I couldn't do this work authentically, I said, I have to go and I have to go. And I'm good. Actually, I'm leaving academic medicine. I was offered associate dean for diversity at actually at Harvard Medical School last fall. Um, and people are like, you gave that up too? And I, and, I, and I said, no, because I think that I can take my own path and I can work with these organizations. So I still am working with academic medical centers, but externally where I can actually say what I want to say, mm -hmm. be as bold as I want to be 
and really push them to change, uh, change culture because that's what needs to happen. Because what we're seeing is that when you create, when you have organizations that have an equitable work environments, right? Where, mm -hmm. where people are, there's a culture of fear, people can speak openly, you know, people of color are not staying, they're not being promoted, they're leaving. That actually has an, has an impact on the care that you provide. Right, that, that that you know, we know that a diverse workforce is is important to addressing and eradicating racial health inequities. And so, if we don't have a supportive work environment, right, then we'll never be able to reach the goal that we want to reach. So, on that, um, can you know, health equity? Now we we're talking about it um, widely. Um, can you define what that really means? What health equity really means, and also healthcare disparities. Yeah, and you know, and I think so. What health equity is is what I think anyone working in healthcare, not just a clinician, wants for everybody, and that's for everyone to attain their highest health potential possible. Right? We want mm -hmm. everyone in their best in their best health. And with health inequities, are um, are are differences in health that are created by social, economic, and environmental disadvantage. And, and, and when I say that, that is actually man-made, human-made as a result mm -hmm. of, of, of social and economic policies. I can, you know, when we talk about um, health, health inequities, we actually see that there are policies from the 1930s, like redlining, right? Like the GI Bill. You why don't you explain what redlining is? Because sure, yeah, yeah. And, and, and I'm sure there are people, um, you know, on on the call today that you know have heard of redlining and 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 and, and probably know it well. But I think that what people need to understand is that there were policies that were um, generated by our own government that have actually impacted the health of communities even decades today. decades later, almost a century later today. And so, what redlining is, um, it's part of the came out of the New Deal, which was, you know, in the 1930s, um, FDR, there was a series of programs and, 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 and public works and initiatives was to help, you know, Americans recover from the Great, Depre Great Depression. And out of that was created the, uh, the FHA, the Federal Housing Authority. And so that agency was actually um, responsible for creating this policy called redlining, where neighborhoods were actually graded A, B, C, or D, the D neighborhoods were the red ones, A was green, and these neighborhoods were graded um, based on sort of one of the factors was based on who lived there, what were the racial and ethnic composition of those neighborhoods. The significance of this grading was that it impacted your, the ability of someone living in that area to acquire a federally backed mortgage or mortgage insurance. And, and so um, I will say the University of Richmond University has really a great website. You can pull up redlining mm -hmm. maps from any of the, the major, major cities. But actually what we see now is um, neighborhoods that were redlined in the 1930s. And, and, and they have the original documents on this website. Yeah. It's, it's fascinating. But those are the same neighborhoods that in current day have, you know, the shortest life expectancies that have the highest asthma diabetes rates, the highest infant mortality rates. And so that's not by design. You know, I think you probably have heard of this difference in zip codes, like, you know, zip yes. code can actually determine your health. Well, that is because of the impact of these policies on our social determinants of health. It's incredible. Yeah, I was going to mention the, the term, which people use a lot, social determinants of health, but it all emanates, right, from, from um, policies so with respect to um, what you're doing now uh, with your organization, what kind of services education are, are you bringing and to whom? Right. So I, I am working, as I mentioned, with medical schools, but also healthcare systems, um, healthcare startups around. I don't just do talks like this, but I also do trainings around um, health equity, around um, racism in healthcare. So I'm giving some historical context for how we arrived to where we are now and how that influences the social determinants of health and what we need to do to get out of this. But I also do um, racial equity culture assessments for organizations, right? To see, you know, what is the climate really like within your organization? And I also provide recommendations um, as well as performing what I call equity audits, reviewing policies um, and practices, hiring, retention, promotion, 
um, policies for the organizations um, who really are, are concerned and want to prioritize, you know, cre creating an environment where a diverse workforce um, can be nurtured. You know, somebody, when we did registration, we asked people for questions and somebody wrote in a very good question, which uh, I want to add, which bears on this, which, you know, in the training that you're doing, I imagine there are a lot of white people and white men in the, you know, in the audience, as well as non-white people and men. What do you get pushback when you start talking about these issues? And if you do, what, what kind of pushback is it? You know, so I, I really try to go, especially with my trainings, um, I really try to, to go in um, with, um, you know, I, I talk about growth mindset, right? Making sure that people are acknowledging that the information that's being presented to you is going to be new and that and hopefully you'll be open to it. Um, but I think also, you know, I give a lot of historical context and, and history is, is history, right? And, and we have a lot of data that supports um, sort of what we're seeing right now in terms of racial health inequities. And so it's not often that I get pushback, but I actually I was sharing with you earlier that you know, I had a training yesterday at a very well-known um, healthcare institution in the city. And, you know, I did, I did get pushback. And, you know, you know I, I got pushback talking about historical, historical points, like um, Marion Sims, who is um, the, the father of, of, of modern gynecology. His statue was actually in front of the New York Academy of Medicine, but it was taken down last year. He's a very controversial figure um, who basically experimented on women who were enslaved. But I essentially had people in the audience try to tell me that, you know, but he was a good man. And it's not about him being a good or bad man. It's sure. just that we need to hold space for the fact that, yes, someone could have made these really wonderful contributions to medicine, um, but they could also have done it in a very horrifying, egregious way. Well, on that note, um, you know, when you and I spoke um, before, we talked about Tuskegee, right? And um, I think one thing that we've seen from the past few months with COVID is obviously the health disparities are rampant um, in communities of color. And um, we also see that sometimes they there's a lot of reticence, right, to go into the traditional healthcare system, right? There's a lot of mistrust. Can you talk a little bit about Tuskegee and how that impacted it and, and where that leaves us today? Sure, yeah, definitely. I mean, in a lot of my talks and trainings, they go over this, um, this sort of this timeline to show that um, this distrust that communities of color, you know, have towards the healthcare establishment and even part like participating in clinical trials that mm -hmm. is really based on these really these historical occurrences that were quite significant. So you mentioned um, to, the Tuskegee experiment, and you know that is an experiment I think for a lot of Black Americans that that you know we we hold in our memory. So that was a study that was sponsored by the U.S. Public Health Service. It spanned from 1932 to 1972, and essentially, in, the whole goal of the study was to see what would happen to people if you left syphilis untreated. <laughs> yeah, uh -huh. um, and and so they essentially enrolled uh, these uneducated black men in the South. Um, they told them that they had bad blood. They never told them of the diagnosis, and even once a um, treatment, penicillin, had been developed. Um, there were a proportion of, this, of the a portion of the participants that were never given the treatment, and many of them went on to infect their partners. And there were even they developed advanced syphilis, secondary and tertiary syphilis, and even some of their children were born with congenital syphilis. Um, and, and so, you know, and, and this is a study that was, um, you know, was federally funded, right? Um, but this again, you know, I think people remember the study. And so when we're talking about even clinical trials today, right, mm -hmm. and ensuring, uh, you know, adequate representation, I think I think specifically for this vaccine, it's, it's important because we've been seeing the disproportionate impact that coronavirus has had on Black, Latinx, and Indigenous communities, right? So yeah. um, that's very important. Those efforts are important, right, to recruit, make sure we have recruit a diverse uh, representation of participants. Well, you start, I absolutely agree. Um, and I, I 
spoke about it a little bit recently. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You, you, yeah, you yeah, did I talk did. about I it uh, on, on CBS. With an, on no, CBS. no, no. It was in no. a magazine. Or, yeah. Okay. But I think the other thing, you know, you started by saying the low percentage of Black physicians, right? And what isn't it? you know, isn't it more likely that if you are Black and have a Black physician, there's more of a connection there, right? And the fact that a lot of people can't see a Black physician is an issue. So is what's happening in medical education? I mean, that's a big... I You're like, like, what's happening? I what's know. happening? Like, what are they doing? No, really. I mean, this is, that's a big issue. Yeah, no, definitely. It's a big issue. And like the numbers haven't really budged that much over the last few decades. Even since my mom was in medical school, the numbers really of, of black physicians haven't budged. Um, what I do want to say, though, is that like the same reasons that we have racial health inequities are the same reasons why we have a paucity of black physicians, right? Like, so mm -hmm. to get to medical school, like, you know, you have to one, be exposed to people who, you know, there's role modeling, right? So, you know, you have to have seen someone that looks like you, but also when we're thinking about how, because of policies like redlining, how communities of colors have been disinvested in, that in impacts education. We know that property taxes go towards education, right? So if you are not receiving, a, a, you know, a high quality education, right? You're not exposed to physicians. You don't have the opportunity, another social determinant of health, for you know gainful employment or to purchase property, which is one way you accumulate health, a wealth. Right? You are probably going to be ill prepared and ill positioned to be applying to medical school. Right? That may be something mm -hmm. that's not even that you wouldn't even consider. So you know, I think in terms of when we're thinking about bias and racism and addressing it, we have to think about just not the pipeline, right? The pipeline of people going into medicine, but also, you know, the care that we're providing and how we're providing that care. And, you know, the past several months, um, you know, the issues have, have been in the news a lot, right? So shining a light on it, which is very, very important. Having conversations like this, having conversations that we've never had before. Right. Um, in all, and frankly, in all parts of my life, we're, we're, we're talking about it. I guess what I want in, you know, some guidance on number one is like, what are concrete things that we can actually do, right? At, like, I mean, many of the people on this call are in business, right? And the issues are no different there in terms of racial disparities. Right. What can we do um, in our organizations or with our friends? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, no, yeah, I think that's a great question. And I think that, you know, we're in this, this very unprecedented um, and also transformative moment. I think that if we don't really talk about these issues now, right, if this is not a good time, then I don't know when it is, not just given the pandemic, but given, you know, we have, you know the killings and or oh, yeah. the shootings of Black Americans over the last um, few months that have been, you know, caught on video and obviously are very horrifying. Um, and I think that, you know, organizations really need to um, think about that one, this is like, this is a long term commitment, right? Like, like, we are in the situation we are right now, where we have, you know, a paucity of healthcare professionals of color and these, in these health inequities, because we're like, we're literally centuries in, right? And so I, I think the first thing I need organizations to realize is that this is not going to change overnight, right? So, so it's going to take um, a long standing commitment, but it also has to take intentional work. And I always say it, it starts with the leadership of the, whoever's leading the organization that has to be a value and a priority, like, like you know, anti-racism, right, it has to be a value and priority of whoever is leading that organization, because if it's not, you know, that, that, you know, that it ultimately trickles down to the rest of the organization. And then I think when you're thinking about strategic plans and practices and policies within your organization, um, you need to think about, you know, are you, are you using a lens of equity? You know, I think a lot of times, you know, we don't real. you know, people don't realize it. And another reason why I think, you know, data is very important, but in terms of like keeping metrics over who you're hiring, who you're rotating, who you're promoting, um, you know, I think those are, those are really key to figuring out like, you know, what is happening within your organization. So, you know, I admit, you know, we all have our blind spots, 
you know, for a very long time, I literally was the only black physician in my department at NYU. And, and none of my colleagues said a thing. <laughs> you know, I, I'd be sitting in faculty meeting, but no one just said, hey, you know, I, you know, I noticed that, you know, we need to do better, right? And so I'm hoping like, you know, what's been going on over the last few months that now I'm not gonna be the only person to notice that. Like, I, we need, I, you know, folks that don't look like me to also, you know, come on board and to make these, you know, observations. But, but also I think that, you know, top down, looking at practices and policies, I think um, keeping track of the data, right? And seeing like, what are your goals, right? Like what, right. what kind of representation do you want to have within your organization in terms of women, in terms of people of color, right? And it has to be intentional. It cannot be an afterthought. And I think a lot of times organizations think by hiring like a chief diversity officer, like that is going to fix things. Like that is merely a band-aid. You cannot put like <laughs> centuries of work on one person, right? It has to be embedded in almost every role um, of the organization. Yeah. And well, your case in point, right? At NYU, you were in, in charge of diversity and you weren't even enabled, right? You weren't... Um, right, yeah, I wasn't enabled. And, I, and what I actually realized is that I was, I was essentially a figurehead like, I, I literally thought, I think they were surprised. I think they were, they saw me, I, they knew that I was very energetic and eager and, oh, let's put her in the role. But they didn't actually think that I would actually want to push for change, that I would want to see Black faculty supported more, Black students supported more. Um, and yeah, I mean, so, so I think, you know, leadership of organizations, I think also I think we need to think about how to give other people opportunities. I think what anti-racism work also involves is that, you know, sometimes it's about giving people who don't, who have not been traditionally in that role a chance, mm -hmm. right? You know, and, and then also rethinking what are qualifications, right? I think, you know, there's a very rigid sense in a lot of organizations about, you know, what are the qualifications we're looking for? What is a good fit, right? The especially, good the good fit, fit, especially the good fit part. Right. I, I love that you said that because, you know, when people say there's a, you know, there's a great, you're the, you're the best person for the job, not to me, but like to whomever, I'm like, they're the, because they were in a data set, right? If you're not in that data set, you don't right. even have a chance, right? There's no one right person. So um, the other thing I really liked um, and want to reinforce what you said is, it's incumbent upon um, everyone to take a stand, right? I mean, you know, I need to be cognizant of what's going on in my organization and take a stand, right? And point things out and, you know, all of that. So I think it is, um, it's really incumbent for people to think yeah. about. And can I just add that, like, you know, even as like, I just mentioned, like, the good fit part, like, you know, like, there are ways, like, we know that having structured processes, like having, you know, predetermined interview questions or um, predetermined criteria to evaluate, you know, employees is, is really important because a lot of times, whether we realize it or not, we bring our biases into these situations. And so you, you could be interviewing someone for a job and, hey, we went to the same high school. And you end up talking about that for half an hour and you don't, you don't even have the yeah. opportunity to assess whether this, this person actually has the skills for the job, but they're a good fit. So we have to have them, you know, on our team. So we have to hire them. Right. Um, so here we're in New York City and uh, you, we just issued this report last week on the digital health ecosystem, right? The state of digital health there. You know, we we were curious, has COVID um, impacted that, right? Like in terms of funding in a negative way and the exact opposite. I mean, there is more money going into digital health than ever before. Like yeah. in the seven months, yeah, you know, more than all of 2019. So, okay, great. New York is the hub. But what can the digital health community do to further what we're talking about here. I mean, there are companies that we know about like City Block and Healthify, yeah. but what else can the digital health community do? How do you envision working with them or how quickly? Yeah, no, that's such a great question. And I actually think like digital health companies are the next horizon in terms of like the work that I do, because, you know, I think we, 
what I will say is this, like over the past like 50, 60 years, we've had such significant advances in healthcare technology that actually haven't closed the gap in racial health inequities. They've been, they've been very, very persistent. And so, you know, you would think technology, that means better, better, better care, better health, but not necessarily. And so I think that, you know, in, in this moment, you need these, you need these companies and, and leadership to really think about, you know, how are we making a difference? Like, are we using a lens of health equity where we're reaching the populations that need to be reached, right? The ones that are, you know, more disadvantaged. And so, you know, I, I think, um, you know, thinking about social determinants of health is, is going to be key because we know that structural racism is a key driving force of the social determinants of health, thinking about, you know, what communities are you um, engaging with? I think that that's also very important. Um, and then ultimately thinking about looking at your metrics, you know, who are you targeting? What are the health outcomes um, needs to be important? So again, tracking, tracking that data and tracking progress is going to be key because, you know, although we think of technology as something that it's more likely to help people can actually be incredibly um, detrimental to health. Like, I, I don't know if you, you read that article last year in Nature Magazine about that algorithm that I think several insurance companies um, were using um, to allocate resources for care. But you know, when software developers are not thinking about their, you know, the, the unconscious mm -hmm. bias that they have, there may be a detrimental effects to patients. And so there was this algorithm that actually um, calculated how much it would cost to take care of critically ill patients. And they allocated um, a lesser amount for black patients than white patients. And they did this based on data that they had, but what they didn't take into, into consideration is that black patients were not accessing healthcare because they couldn't get to their appointments, right? Because mm -hmm. of you know communication, like there were other barriers to them accessing care. So it wasn't that they needed fewer resources, but this, this algorithm actually affected tens of thousands of patients. Mm -hmm. And so and, and, and so these are the things that we need to think about. And when, when I say, you know, we're talking about health equity, right? And thinking about mm -hmm. whatever product you're designing, you want to make sure that you know that it is that you're you're doing this work through a health equity lens. And I think even that telehealth, where, you know, yeah. some of these apps where you're using text messaging, what if people don't have a like, broadband access? Or also, what if they, you know, in terms of their educational levels, you know, are they able to understand what's being texted to them? Can they, can, are they able to read it properly? So there are a, a lot of different considerations that need to be, um, you know, yeah, taken, taken into consideration, essentially. Yeah, uh, our a friend Gail Otto, who's the CEO of Rubicon MD, last week published an article on just that, um, that telehealth really should be the great equalizer, and it's not at all. And, you know, one of the social determinants of health should is broadband, right? Absolutely. Or just, or, yeah, Wi-Fi in, in your home. I mean, and then having, a, you know, some sort of smart phone. Um, right. I mean, we're even seeing that with the kids, like with, with schools, oh, yeah, with right? Schools. I mean, we're, we're seeing that there, there definitely already is this pre-existing, um, they call it achievement gap, but I like to call it like opportunity gap. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, we're doing, we, we're having this remote learning, but, you know, if children don't have access to, to, to broadband, then they're not going to be able to do their work, right? And we're seeing these, these differences based on communities. So, you know, thinking about COVID, right, and the whole vaccine and the vaccine trials um, got me thinking about, you know, development of drugs and devices, you know, through now. Um, and I think, you know, historically, um, you know, these trials are very prescribed, right? And so, um, you know, the Black populations, Latin populations, you know, basically non-white populations haven't really been represented. How going forward, you know, if there is this um, inherent suspicion, so the mm -hmm. health system, going forward, what could companies do to eradicate that and make sure they are enable recruiting into the trials? Yeah, and with COVID. Yeah, no, and you know, and I'm glad that I'm seeing like more of this discussion um, in the lay media, and I know that 
Moderna, like their phase one trial for coronavirus vaccine, literally, I think it was like 89% white <laughs> participants. And I'm like, really? Like, no, but, but apparently I went to their website, they're doing a better job with the, this is the phase three and also mm -hmm. um, Pfizer in terms of recruitment. And so, you know, given like the, the history that we talked about, given Tuskegee and given also um, Henrietta Lacks, which some people on the call, may, they may know about her, but she, you know, she was a... Um, a 31-year-old um, Black woman from impoverished Baltimore who presented to Johns Hopkins Hospital in the 1930s, I think, um, with metastatic um, uterine cancer. And her cells were actually taken from her without her consent. They're known as the HeLa cells. I used them in medical school in my histology class, um, but and they were immortalized. So companies literally have made billions of dollars off her cells. Her cells are actually still being used now in research and development of the coronavirus vaccine. Um, but, you know, so again, but, but these stories are really well known in our communities that people are like, I don't want to get involved in that. But what's interesting is a lot of the data shows that if, if participants are fully informed about the benefits of the trial to, as, to them as an individual, to their communities, like to the greater population, um, that actually Black and Latinx patients are more likely than white patients to sign up for the trials. Yeah, exactly. And so, but, but I think also part of it has to be about a nuanced outreach and messaging. So, you know, I, I spoke to you that I was working with about with a pharmaceutical company recently, and um, you know, I talked to them about really engaging with community-based organizations that are already on the ground in these communities doing the work and that are led by trusted leaders. And that can look like churches, that could look like um, YMCA's neighborhood coalitions, but I think also the messenger just can't be the company. <laughs> you have to, it's really about engagement and partnership um, with organizations that already are trusted on the ground doing the work. And also with physicians. I mean, because physicians are all, often the number one reason you enroll or don't enroll in a clinical trial. Yeah, it, it's very true. Yeah, I'm actually going to be working. Um, I have a contract with another company. I don't know if they're on the call, but they're, they're, very start, busy. Uh, they're, they're a startup <laughs> for clinical trials. But we're going to be talking about, because usually it's the physicians that have their, are, are enrolling patients and their community physicians and sort of mm -hmm. how do they talk to their patients about, you know, how do, you, how do they recruit them? But I also did want to mention that it's not just about, um, you know, the outreach and messaging, but also it's important to think about what do these participants need to be able to engage in the trial successfully? So is it because if they're working during the day, do we need to have, um, you know, after hours uh, where the clinic is open so they could come and participate? Um, do they need um, resources for the bus or, or the train to actually get to the clinical site, right? Mm -hmm. So all of those things we actually need to think about, right? Like all the social determinants of health, it's all, it's all linked to, you know, whether or not these, people, these participants can, can engage with the trial. So we have a bunch of questions coming in. And um, I, James Maisel, Zydok, um, I don't get, you've got a ton of questions. Keep it oh, yeah. fairly, keep it fairly short, James, but I'm going to allow you to talk. And you just need to unmute yourself. Oh, uh, okay. Hi. Hi. Thank you, buddy. Yeah. Okay. Go for it. Let's see you, uh, Dr. Blackstock. You're doing a great job there, I think. Um, so, um, He's a doctor it, too. Yeah. In uh, IT and specifically, the racial diversity became a big issue with the imaging. Uh, I think it's good to include uh, everybody in the trials. Hopefully the COVID and everything will be there. Um, you know, do you think that the affirmative action programs uh, that started in the 60s, 70s in college and medical school were actually helpful? And yes, I do. Sorry, so I finished your question. <laughs> yeah, if not, uh, so you do. And well, the reason, I don't really yeah. have to hear of that. I'm sorry, see the last part again? Why don't we have more of that? Yeah, no, so that's such a great, I think it's a great question because, you know, actually I wrote a piece in the Chicago Tribune last November just about this because um, my mother was one of the first classes at Harvard Medical School to benefit from these, um, what they call diversity initiatives, but essentially were affirmative action policies. 
And, you know, and she was one of the first classes that had like, the largest number of, of Black students. And so, you know, I think obviously, as we know from history over time, you know, these policies have become, um, you know, incredibly controversial. But I have to say that, you know, I am a, a huge proponent of affirmative action, I think, especially in healthcare, because we've, we've, we've seen what happens when we don't have, um, you know, healthcare professionals that look like their patients. We are, we are, we are having these very profound, um, appalling um, health inequities. And so I think that schools now, because of, you know, because of lawsuits, et cetera, um, you know, are definitely using, you know, different criteria in terms of, you know, in terms of evaluating um, students. But I know just from speaking to, to um, leadership, like at Harvard Medical School and a lot of the other medical schools, that this is definitely something that is um, a concern and a priority of theirs. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, James. Hopefully we'll see you in the not too distant future. Um, Louisa Holland, how are you? I want you to ask a question. So you just need to unmute yourself. Wow, I didn't think we'd get to actually talk. It's nice to see you. Hi. So great to hear all the voices. I thought you were going to read the questions out. This is great. It's, it's very well. Wait, and you know what? Wait, wait, wait. You know what? Can you, um, for people who are asking questions, Please just say who you are, like what you do, where you work. So oh, yeah, that'd be great. Sure. So um, I'm Louisa Holland, and I work with a company called VML YNR, which is a, a major um, communications company, and we have a very large health practice. So we do a lot of communicating directly with physicians and with patients. And mm -hmm. my question is around, you know, if you really wanted to get engaged in helping to solve, not that we have the ability to solve, but to try to solve or have an, an impact to improve some of the racial disparities in health specifically. I get your point that clearly if we had more black doctors, it would be a lot better. And that's a very long game, right? To, to improve right. education and get more, more black doctors. But in the near term, what would you say is the, the thing that we could do that would have the of the best impact is clinically. Like where, where can we intervene to really help clinically today? No, that, that is such a great question. And I also want to just make the point that we need all healthcare professionals like to be able to, to have the skills to take care of a diverse right. patient population. Right. So, you know, definitely, you know, having more, more practitioners of color definitely is um, one part of the solution, but we but obviously um, is this not the, the full solution? And so I think, you know, so, so some things that I said a little bit earlier, you know, I, you know, I, I do provide trainings and I want to give just um, a disclaimer on the trainings. Like, I think one training is not going to make a difference. And so when I work with organizations and we talk about, you know, about racism in healthcare, and we talk about unconscious bias and I give them strategies to work with. Um, I also say that this is um, a starting off point for having conversations in your organization about, how you're going to create structural change. I think that a lot of it can be, you know, about, you know, what's in your organization's strategic plan, um, looking at the, the practices and policies within your organization. And then I think in terms of direct patient care, um, you know, I do go over like debiasing strategies so that people can actually utilize in their care. But I think also looking at, you know, metrics, looking at, for example, I worked with, um, uh, an emergency department that found that, you know, their black patients were waiting 80 minutes longer to be admitted <laughs> to the hospital than, than other patients. And so we actually went back in the whole process from when the patient arrived to when the patient's admitted to actually figure out, you know, where the lesions were. And then we came up with structured processes um, for addressing those lesions. So did, did physicians need reminders to go check on the patient again? And then we actually had a dashboard um, for providers um, to see how they were doing in terms of how they were caring for patients um, of different racial and ethnic backgrounds. So I think that, I know I gave you a lot, <laughs> um, but I think that there is a lot of work that can be done all the way from your strategic plan to your practices and policies, um, all the way down to um, direct patient care. And I also always think that it's important to think about the communities that you're um, healthcare professionals are engaging with, right? 
and, or whatever product you have is engaging with. I think um, getting the perspective of people who use your product, people who come to your healthcare institution is incredibly important. And so whether you do that in terms of surveys, in terms of focus groups, in terms of interviews, you need to collect that data because you need to make sure that you're not missing potential blind spots. Um, and then also, I'm sorry, I, I, I said all these oh, ideas. And, great. and then another thing is just even looking at like, looking at metrics in terms of how different groups are doing in terms of their health outcomes, right? People who come to you, like how are diabetic patients doing? How are patients with hypertension doing, right? I know a lot of organizations are doing that and then just aggregating it by different demographics, not just race, gender, socioeconomics, um, to actually seeing like, you know, is everyone receiving affordable care? That's great, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Louise is a fellow alumna, by the way. A little um, older than you, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Toyin. Um, I have, oh, is that my Toyin? <laughs> I don't know. It's your Toyin. Hi, Toyin. You just need to unmute yourself. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Hi, this is Toyin Adeyemi, um, an infectious disease physician here oh. in Chicago. And excellent today, just following your work and listening to you today, it's been really excellent. So I'm in HIV and uh, was in academia for 20 years and more recently now in pharma, still looking at doing HIV work and disparities work. And again, just the points you made um, around, and I have a daughter who's applying for med school. And again, the numbers haven't changed. 28 years later, 5% mm -hmm. and you know how many make professor. So again, it's important to keep doing that work. My questions were, one, around the role of um, pair, pair, uh, pair navigators and community ambassadors in doing the messaging. So we do that with HIV and in prevention. Actually, people from the community and you know, granting them employment, having them be part of developing the message, how it's delivered, who's going to deliver it, and having them be part of that. And the second point is, how, has, how, how is your organization looking at um, showing these companies, including healthcare uh, institutions, the incredible financial, I mean, let's forget the altruistic and the moral reasons to do it, uh, financial advantages of having a diverse leadership. I'm not talking about the workforce, because a lot of places mm -hmm. will put out their metrics and their numbers and put, you know, we have X people of color, but when we get to the leadership, the number is, is really low. Right. So right. how do we show them the financial uh, benefits of having leadership that has a diverse lived experience. Um, right. Yeah, no, it's just such great questions. And on the last point, I may need your help because I personally, like philosophically, try not to bring up the financial um, part. Of course, here I am talking to um, yeah. business leaders. Um, you know, I mean, I just feel like what better argument than talking about life and death? It's like, the right thing to do. <laughs> Yes, I mean, I don't know, I don't know what more you need. So, so we we should talk after the call. Um, but I'm glad that you also brought up the piece about community um, navigators. I actually wrote a piece um, in the Washington Post a few months ago about community health workers. So I think it's sort of the same idea, but really um, engaging people in the community, offering them a, a source of employment, but also using them in not using them, but having them actually lead us in, in terms of the work that we're doing within within their communities. And I think that's something that is very underutilized. And so I'm glad that you brought that up, Toyin. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, here's one from um, an anonymous, wants to be anonymous. Um, how would you advise DE&I leaders to balance the historical need to focus on racial equity with contemporary demands to add other groups? to the DEI conversation? Yeah, no, wait, so that's a great question. Um, and what I will say, and I'm, I'm gonna be very transparent about this. I think when you when you look at the, at, at the racial health inequities and you, and you look at um, sort of the legacy of racism in this country, what I will say is um, we have seen like the, the most detrimental impact on black communities and that we, we actually, you know, we have, you know, we are, Essentially, slavery was the be, you know beginning of the beginning of this country, and so while I think it's important to bring in other groups, um, I, I think we need to do so while acknowledging um, 
acknowledging the history and also acknowledging that when you bring up the groups that have been most um, most detrimentally affected, everyone everyone benefits from that. Um, but I definitely understand that this is a probably a more complex and complicated um, effort to address. And I, and, I, and I do think that everyone's voices need to be heard, but I think we need to think about um, you know, the, the, the historical context and, 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 and what we see now as a result of that history. Okay, next up is, what Hi, is Joe. Joe. Is Joe. Uh, Joe, connect, Joe connected us. Yes, Joe connected us. You're the connector. I'm the connector. Thanks. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> nice to see you, Dr. Blackstock and Bunny. Um, yeah, so just I was thinking about some of the places I've been. Uh, yeah, so I'm a healthcare IT founder, and now I'm, I guess I'm in the connecting business. And uh, <laughs> I was just wondering. You're very from, good at it. It's a, it's a good business. I, I love doing it. Um, I was just wondering, from the local perspective, to the extent that uh, network access and bandwidth is a factor for for telehealth, are you plugged into the New York City CTO, and are you plugged into their uh, internet master plan, and what's happening with that? I am not, but I have a feeling you will connect me. <laughs> I certainly will. Thank you. No, I just put a link to the. I put a link to the plan. Um, it's John Paul Farmer in his office, and. I will definitely reach out to you both okay. on LinkedIn. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I Ada um, has um, Ada has. If you would unmute Ada, you. you Hi. Uh, Hi. Can you hear me, Hi. Ada? <laughs> we can. And Ada, tell us where you're. Ada. <laughs> Ryan Lair. Um, tell us where you're calling yeah. from and who you, you know what you do. Okay. Hi, uh, Dr. Blackstock. Um, my name is Adele Kafo. I'm calling from Philly. I'm actually an attorney and I practice in the health law and employee benefits space. Uh, so I saw this on LinkedIn. I come from a family of doctors, but I did not go that route. But I saw your this post on LinkedIn and I was just like, this um, sounds really interesting. I'm interested in this area. So I have kind of two questions, not really related, but maybe. Um, so at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, there was, I don't know if you were aware, but there was this rumor going around that, you know, black people were somehow immune from COVID um, and that it was basically like a white person's thing. And um, and now the story has like completely switched to black people are, you know, disproportionately impacted by COVID. Yeah. And so do you think that this like black myth kind of played a factor in the disproportionate numbers we're seeing now amongst the black community? Um, and then also, do you know if the COVID numbers, you know, when we talk about the black community kind of as this monolith, it's not, but uh, do you know if the numbers are broken down between African-Americans versus Africans versus Jamaicans and Caribbeans? And I ask that coming, I'm African, full disclosure, coming from that community that I think that myth is even so more so there that, you know, COVID does not affect Africans. And so I'm just wondering your, your take on that. And then I, I can ask the second question. Yeah, no, so that's such a great question. So yeah, no, actually I did hear about that, the myth that um, black people could not um, be infected with COVID. And there was also another myth about um, 5G cell phone service um, being um, in, implicated in, in, in COVID infections. But anyway, but I think what happened is that, you know, um, I think part of this like distrust that we've been talking about, you know, that is, you know, historical and definitely valid and just, I think definitely that probably uh, influenced some of these myths that we are hearing. However, you know, I think it's hard to say and hard to quantify what effect that actually had um, in terms of, you know, the COVID morbidity and mortality, because what we do know is that there were factors um, like the fact that our communities have a higher burden of chronic disease, that we are more likely to take public transportation, we're more likely to be essential um, and service workers, um, we're more likely to live in overcrowded housing, that we're, we're, that we're more likely to be factors involved in the, the, the disproportionately high rates that we've seen uh, of, of COVID-19. Of COVID um, and I want you also to know that I have not seen any breakdown, and I've probably been, I've been keeping a meticulous track of this, but I haven't seen any breakdown looking at um, these rates um, disaggregated by like, ethnicity among Black people. I haven't seen like Afro-Caribbean, African-American, or, or African from the continent, but I think that would be um, very a very interesting study to do. And you had another question. 
I did. Thank you for answering that first one. And so the second question, um, you know, you talked about this. Um, it seems like this surgeons of um, chief diversity officers and inclusion officers at different organizations in the wake of, you know, the George Floyd protests and just these nationwide protests and companies showing solidarity and things like that. But I was wondering, um, sometimes, I mean, even at my law firm, we do a lot of diversity training. And I just wonder whether that kind of falls on deaf ears and whether it makes more sense to do this at the beginning of the pipeline. So do you think that it would help if and I don't know, please correct me if I'm wrong. If medical sorry, schools- my, my, kids, my kids just came home. So if you hear okay. kids, sorry. Hi. Sorry. No, pro no problem at all. Um, sorry. Mm -hmm. If um, medical schools, you know, would do a better job educating students about maybe some health concerns or diseases specific to communities of colors, I'm thinking like sickle cell or lupus, or maybe do implicit bias training as part of the curriculum. Do you think that that would have a more impactful outcome than already mm -hmm. teaching people who are already like coming out than yeah. already doing these type of trainings when people are already set in their ways and have been practicing medicine a particular way for so long. Yeah, no, I, think that actually, yeah no, I think that's an excellent, excellent point. I think that um, I will say that in my experience is that black students and other students of color have been the driving forces at medical schools to really uh, change not change the curriculum to ensure that these these issues that racism unconscious bias is being addressed as early in education as possible because I, I I do agree like once you go through your medical school and once you go through your training and then all of a sudden you're having these these trainings you know it's really hard to um, create create change right because you're already I, I know the process you, you know these values and priorities are instilled in you um, every step of the way um, and I, I, I agree I would say even before medical school I mean this needs to be a part of of, of early early childhood education I mean it, it, it's you know obviously it is very heavy you know heavy uh, material um, but we but I think that one of our paths forward is, is really discussing this and being more transparent about our conversations about racism. So we're just about out of time. Okay. Um, before, before we leave though, um, I usually ask people, what makes you hopeful? What makes you hopeful oh. sure that, you know, all the work you're doing? What yeah, you know, yeah, no, I, so that's a great question. I, I think by nature, I am an optimist. <laughs> I'm an optimist. Um, but I also think that, especially in this moment, as I mentioned, it's very, it's, you know, it's an unprecedented moment and we're having conversations that, that I, I mean, I'm going to be 43, it's not, we haven't had in my lifetime, um, and we're having them in a very candid and, and, and open way. And so I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that out of this moment that we can um, create some change that will actually benefit everyone. I think what people don't realize is that um, racism harms all of us, right? It, it harms all of us in, in, in multiple ways, whether we realize it or not. And so I think instead of shying away from these, uh, you know, uncomfortable topics um, and conversations, we really need to, to embrace it. Well, I want to thank you so much for spending time with us. We are incredibly lucky to have had you. And um, I feel really lucky to have gotten thank to see you. you. Uh, and we will uh, we'll look forward to reading and hearing from you in the future. Um, but hopefully the folks on the call um, got some very specific ideas about how they really can move forward and uh, really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone who stayed on. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Okay, bye.